bless you so much for heeding our invitation and joining the fast as well. So without much I do, we we'll invite the prophet, uh, prophet Babs to be a blessing unto the whole of Africa. So man of God, welcome and God bless you and welcome from Ghana, Nigeria, Malawi, each and every place over the whole of Africa. God bless you. I'll hand over the mic right now. Hallelujah. So you can unmute yourself um, and go ahead. Thank you very much. Good evening, Pastor Ernest, good evening, and um, good evening, everyone, um, where you are at. Um, the Lord be with you. Um, it's a blessing um, to be a part of um, the meetings, the prayings, and the watchings um, that are going on. Um, we want to thank God for such a time as this. Priesthood is one of those things that we need to employ um, in a more definitive manner as we engage the dynamics, the spiritual dynamics of the end of days, of the end times. It appears that in these end times, the ancient original things that ruled the earth and that influenced mankind, even though at a time and for long seasons seemed to have gone dormant, are suddenly awoken and awakened again but with greater sophistication in the days that we are in. And so um, we have to, in order to be able to understand the end times, because the end time is going to spiritually as well as physically and natural phenomena wise, round up the age, the ages of the earth that we've been living in, 
we, we have to understand and have a grasp of the nature of forces and influences that have prevailed in the earth from the beginning. The ancient things are surfacing again, but with greater sophistication in the end of days. And you see, that's why we have to engage things prophetically because the prophetic takes into account the ancient things. The prophetic is the voice of the ancient original things, the ancient things in modern times. Hallelujah. And so as we engage, we have to have our minds and spirit of understanding deepened to be able to engage the things that are the current dynamics of the world that we are living in. Can we have a word of prayer? Can we say prayer briefly? Can you lift your hands and just pray where you are at and ask God in heaven and ask God to open a portal of heaven over where you are at, like the portal of Bethel, where there was ascending and descending of angelic activity, where there was the proclamation and the definition of covenant things, where there was the alignment of spiritual genealogies, of prophetic genealogies, where inheritance was transferred, not just by word of mouth, but by spiritual access and impartation, and where territory was allotted, and God spoke to Jacob and said, this land that you are lying down upon has been given to you for an inheritance. So can you ask God to open a portal of heaven, a gate of heaven, a window of heaven over where you are at so that there can be transaction, there can be traffic, there can be ascending and descending so that illumination, revelation, impartation, transfer, inheritance, covenants can be awakened, activated, steered into function where you are at so that we are not just having a literary discourse or a mental talk, but we are engaging transactions with the traffic of heaven in this very hour of need for the time and season that we are going into. Father, we thank you. Kobaraba shata, lodoba kaba shaka hai, makaba soto ba. We say, let the gates be open. Let the doors be open. Let the portals be unlocked. Let the angelic assistance come through. The angel of the Lord encamp around those that fear him. Let the angelic encampments commence. Let, let heavenly deliveries be received right now. Let the host of the spirit now become our sphere of traffic, transaction, and trade. Wow, let the gates of the trading places be open. Let the gates of the trading floors be open. Let the red gates of Edom, of the negative trade, now be shut. Let the consequences of the negative trade of Edom, where he sold his birthright for a morsel of porridge, let those gates of negative, deceptive trade now be shut. But let the power of the anointed trading places of the Holy Ghost to the redemptive blood the redemptive power in the blood of the Lamb now be accessible unto us. I declare trading places open. I declare trading floors open. I declare the footfalls of the glassy sea and the storms of fire now accessible unto your royal priesthood right now for our transaction and for our traffic in the purposes of heaven for our lives our destiny and the destiny of Africa, so shall it be in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. You know, it's very interesting that the prophecy of Prophet Sadhu to pray for Africa, for an emergence in Africa, for that prophecy to come when it did. Because you see, just a few weeks before then, we were here in Nigeria discussing 
about how Africa can no longer have the wrong priesthood representing it. If you are hearing me say amen. Where Africa can no, and African people, individuals, groups, and ethnic cities can no longer have the wrong voices representing it in the world of the spirit and in the world of the natural. The, 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 the shrines and uh, uh, um, as, uh, uh, ancient priesthoods of idolatry and abominations can no longer be the voice of voices representing the black race in the realm of the spirit. People always said that Africa was backward and that Africans were slaves and that the black man has been looked down upon from historical times. But that's not true. That's not true at all. The black race was one of the first to rise in human history. And the black race has always been involved. Black skinned people or Africa based people, continental Africa based people have always been involved with biblical history. Most people will like to tell you that Christianity is the religion of the white man, is the religion of the Americans and the Europeans, and that they now sold it to Africans as part of their colonialist agenda. But I'm telling you, nothing could be further than that, further from the truth than that, because the black race has always been involved in the agenda of God's biblical purposes throughout history. I, 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 and yet it seemed as if we were only introduced to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob just a short while ago. And yet that's, that's a lie. And that has happened only because we have the wrong voices representing us in leadership spheres, in governmental spheres, and in priestly spheres, priesthood spheres. We can no longer afford to allow the altar of Nimrod to be the speaking voice for Africa. We can no longer allow the, the high altar of, of idolatry and witchcraft, global idolatry, global witchcraft to be the high place or altar or priesthood speaking on behalf of Africa. Recently, Black Lives Matter came up again. Black Lives Matter came up as a manifestation of the global black race of the black races altar of priesthood on a global scale. It was a global altar activated and stirred by the black people, but on behalf of the devil, on behalf of idolatry, one more time, once again. Why? You see, it's because the gates and the time cycles of Africa to emerge has come again. The time gates and appointed times for the black race is here upon us again. But you see, the wrong voices and the wrong priesthood and the wrong altars once again want to seize the opportunity to be the ones speaking for the African race in the realm of the spirit and in the leadership governmental justice realms. 
And that's what Black Lives Matter was. It was the old priesthood, the priesthood of the old idolatrous God trying to seize the time, the gate, the, 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 the gates of time for the emergence of Africa yet once again. But this time we are going to rise up and we are going to say no. If you are hearing me say amen. I said we are saying no. We say no to the devil. We say no to idolatry. We say no to the wrong priesthood. We say no to the idea that Christianity and the faith of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a white man's religion that was reintroduced introduced to the black race to colonize him. We reject that wrong narrative. We reject that wrong history. We reject the narrative and the history that says that the culture of Africa is idolatry. The culture of Africa is shrined unto marine spirits, unto forest spirits, unto cannibalistic spirits, unto human sacrifice spirits, unto voodoo, and every other abomination that came out of Babylon that has now become a, a hindrance to the whole continent and to the whole race. We refuse to accept that as our history, accept that as our narrative, as the culture, the globally announced culture of Africa by the media, we say it's a lie. And we say no to it. We say no to the shrines. We say no to that representation. We say no to that kind of leadership. And we reject that kind of priesthood. We refuse to go back into the trading on the spiritual trading floors that led us into slavery and made us a cost, supposedly cost race in the first place, whereas we were raised to lead all of mankind. And now we now have a few voices who want to do it again and raise an altar to save black lives and in the name of black lives, lead nations, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, back into idolatry and as, as a representation of the African culture, we hereby sign it into the cosmos. We sign it into the realm of the spirit. We sign it onto the gates of hell. We proclaim and sign it to the gates of heaven and to the record books of the courts of heaven. We hereby, as a people, declare no! 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 Unto that kind of priesthood. If you are with me, raise your hand and pray in the Holy Ghost. We need to overturn that kind of evil representation. We need to renounce and reject it. Go ahead. Pray it in the spirit. We say no, Lord. All the altars of idolatry that purport to posture themselves as the voice and culture of Africa, we hereby denounce. We denounce them. We renounce them. We reject them. We cut off their covenants. We cut off every conscious and unconscious contracting and trading and aligning with rebellious forces against God who say they speak for all of us. We refuse it and we denounce it now in the name of Jesus. Listen, we need to take time to renounce these things. Because Prophet Sadhu's prophecy about Africa reimagining came at this gate of time where a cycle of causes, evil, and wickedness is supposed to end, and a cycle of reentrance and re restoration was supposed to begin. And at the same time, an altar of the black from the black race purporting to represent the black race to cover the whole of mankind rose up and say, we are, we are a people who, who are Black Lives Matter and our shrine, we have shrines in every, that's what they said in their manual. They have shrines in every one of their chapters where you can connect to ancestors. Why? Because that's supposed to be African culture. We say no. no. And it is, it is, listen, it is this, 
the very thing that happened in the beginning with Nimrod that raised up an altar on behalf of the globe, but from a black lineage, a black lineage. And I want to point that out to you right now. If you please, if you take a look, take a look at Genesis chapter 10. When Noah and his descendants came out of the ark of Noah. Right now, if you read verse 1 of Genesis chapter 10, it says, now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood, right? So this is the restoration of the human race. This is the reemergence of man on the surface of the earth from the flood. The sons of Japheth are Gomer, Magog, Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tiras. And the sons of Goma are Ashkenaz, Rifat, and Togama. You see, some of these names that you are hearing right now, if you check the end time scriptures about the war of Armageddon and the Ezekiel 38 war, you will see that these same tribes and nations resurface again. They are named again, right? These are the original nations that emerged after the flood, right? And they were under the priesthood of Melchizedek. That was what Noah operated when he offered sacrifice of clean things when they came out of the ark. He offered a sacrifice and God responded with the rainbow as a sign of his authority over creation, right? And you will see that as it was in the ancient times, it has started resurfacing in modern times. And what is now necessary for us as children of God is to reassert the original priesthood that covered the territories of mankind. The Hebrew people believe, and they say scripturally also, that the original number of nations that came out of the you know, flood that, were, that emerged after the period of the flood we are 17 number, and God separated their language and divided their territories according to their language. And from there, all the modern nations began to emerge. Look at verse 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. Everyone after his tongue, their language, and after their families in their nations. Verse six, look at verse six. And the sons of Ham, right, were Cush and Mizraim and Phut and Canaan. And the sons of Cush were Sheba and Havila and Sapta and Rama and Sapteca. And the sons of Sapta were Sheba and the Dan. You will find, if you go to Ezekiel 38, where it starts speaking about the wars of the end, these nations begin to surface. And that's why I'm saying ancient things have resurfaced in modern times, but with greater sophistication. And the original priesthood that was granted then has to be functional again. Look at Verse 8, and Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Now, the word Cush in Hebrew means black, right? Cush was a black man. Cush was the beginning of the black race, right? And if he was a black man and he gave birth to Nimrod, what was Nimrod? Nimrod was a, was a black man. And he therefore, because he descended from a black man. They don't tell us who the mother is, but 
For him to come from a black man, it means he's in the black race. These are the original representations of the black race as man re-emerged from the flood. Why do they call Kush Kush? Why is he called black? Because he was black. He was a black man, right? And as a black man, one of the earliest black men to re-emerge on the earth, they were not small men. They were not downtrodden men. They were not slaves. They were not backward. Actually, they were the leaders. They were the ones who were ahead. They were the ones who held sway. They had royalty, they had power, but Nimrod. Verse 8 says, Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. So the, the black race, contrary to general reportage and uh, 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 um, um, recent history, the black race were not backward. The black race were not the unlearned people. They were not the slaves. They were the leaders. They were the mighty ones. Look at what verse 9 says. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. But you see, these people were mighty. They were the great ones of their times, but there was a problem. That phrase, mighty hunter before the Lord, actually means a mighty one, a mighty hunter against the Lord. Let me read ISV version. The problem was not that they were not mighty, that the black race was not great. The problem was they rebelled. Look at ISV version says, he became a fearless hunter, that's Nimrod, Right. Let me read verse 8. Kush fathered Nimrod, who became the first fearless leader throughout the land. I mean, the African race is pioneering. We are the first leaders throughout the land. Right. But look at the next verse. Verse 9 says he became a fearless hunter in defiance, in defiance of the Lord. That is why it is said, like Nimrod, a fearless hunter in defiance of the Lord. And you see, that is the beginning of the downfall of the black race. When you look throughout scripture, you discover that the black race has always been involved with God. Not everybody was rebellious, right? We are looking at a tale of two priesthoods here. We are looking at a tale of two altars and two lineages of priesthood. One was set in motion by Noah when he offered seven, he offered clean animals when they came out of the ark. And God responded by breaking the curse upon the land so that the earth will yield its fruit to mankind, right? And that's the altar of priesthood. that speaks for God, cheap and power to come upon the land. That's in Genesis chapter 8 and chapter 9. But now we are looking at the problem in chapter 10. We are a mighty one raised up as one of the descendants of the same Noah, right? But he decided to tow the line of another priesthood which began the offering of sacrifices unto devils and unto fallen angels, right? We were black, we were not behind, we were not small, we were not slaves, we were the first leaders, we were the pioneers, we were the pace setters until defiance against God began, right? And so don't let anybody tell you the black race was backward. Historically, scripturally, biblically, culturally, uh, physically and mentally, that has never been true. But you see, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. If you are hearing me, say amen. This man began a priesthood that turned all the abominations that God destroyed the then world for. He turned them on and opened all the gates 
for all the devils that God intended to keep out. Um, in history, alternatively, other than Nimrod, there have been people who participated in the purpose of God to facilitate it, and they were black. For example, you find in the book of Exodus and in the book of Numbers, um, Numbers 30, Numbers 35, that Moses married an Ethiopian woman. Moses married an Ethiopian woman. Aaron, his brother, and Miriam, his sister, and the other people began to murmur. And God stood up against them and rebuked them for attacking Moses because he married an Ethiopian woman. An Ethiopian woman is from Africa, right? And there are Arab looking Ethiopians. They are very black looking Ethiopians. This woman was definitely looking different. She was not looking Semite. She was looking more like the black race. Now I wanna ask you, if Moses married a black woman, an African woman, what were his children like? Moses had two kids. What, what, what was their names? Gershom and Ephraim, right? I'm sure one of the names is Gershom, the sons of Moses. So, so, so where, if, if he married a black woman, were his children white? I mean, like, you know, there are a lot of lies that are in display on behalf of the African race that we were only introduced to the God of Abraham when the white man came during the colonial era. And we allow people to speak for us and become our voices. And these things were lies. God was always in the black race right from the beginning of his ways. In fact, Solomon wrote in the Song of Solomon, he said, we have a sister, she is black because you know, she's been under the sun, she is black. He was referring to a black bride. Solomon dealt with people and women who were of African descent. So how can we say the black race only began to engage the God of the Bible when the white man came during colonialism? We were never called to be behind in the gospel. We were called to be ahead. If you are hearing me, say amen. amen. You remember, right, that Joseph was sold by his brethren into Egypt when they betrayed him, right? Selling him into slavery. And Joseph was in Egypt ahead for years and years, preparing posterity for the people of God, for Israel to go into a nation. I mean, I mean, Israel as a nation, Israel as a people group, as a clan, grew into nationhood in Egypt. Brothers and sisters, is it a mystery that they married Egyptian wives? I mean, even Joseph himself, who brought them into Egypt by God's hand, he married an Egyptian wife. The Bible says he married the daughter of the priest of On, right? He married the daughter of the priest of On. And you know, in Egypt, there is the more Arab looking tribes and then there's the more black skin tribe. The priest of On came from the more black skin tribe. Amen. And if he married his daughter, his daughter was black skin, she was African. Now I want to ask you, the two children of, of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, were they white folks? Were they Europeans? Ephraim and Manasseh, through the blessing of Jacob, became two major tribes inside of the, the tribes of Israel. Right? Do you realize some whole tribes in Israel could have been black skinned? Oh my God. If you are here, give a shout to the Lord. Kobara Bashata. Kiba. Why are we allowing the lying historians and the globalist agenda people to tell our gospel tale? Why? Why? The Bible 
says, when Philip went to Samaria in the New Testament to preach the gospel with signs and wonders, God told Philip to leave Samaria and go into the desert, the desert of Gaza, right? And join when the chariot of the Ethiopian eunuch, hello, Ethiopian eunuch, came to Jerusalem to worship. He came to observe the feast of Passover. Does that ring a bell? A high Ethiopian official. Ethiopia is not in Europe. Neither is it in America. Ethiopia is in the middle of Africa. If somebody hears me say amen. amen. He came there already to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to keep the feast of Passover and the other feasts. And God told Philip, join this chariot. And Philip ran and joined the chariot of the Ethiopian eunuch and preach the gospel unto him. And the Ethiopian eunuch said, behold, here is water. What is keeping me from being baptized? Because I already believe in Jesus Christ. He was a high official of the Ethiopian kingdom and empire. And he got baptized and he took the gospel back to Ethiopia in the middle of Africa. If you are here, say amen. I, I mean, these are Africans involved in the gospel plan of heaven right from the start. The book of uh, Matthew, or is it Luke in the gospel, says, uh, um, let me even go to the book of Acts 13, right? Acts 13, one says, that there were certain prophets and teachers in Antioch that while, oh, mm. Acts 13, one, now they were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called the Niger. Let me use a phrase you may not like. It was called the nigger. <laughs> if you are here, excuse me, where is Niger in the rest of the world? The river Niger is in Africa. Yeah. River Niger is in Nigeria. It is in where? It's in Benin Republic. It's in Senegal. And this guy was called Simeon. I know you don't like the word, but that river is right here in my country. It's not in Europe. This guy had something to do with Nigeria or West Africa or something. For him to be called like that. And then Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene, I believe, is somewhere in Africa, in North Africa. And Manaim, Manaim, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereon. These guys were in the original apostolic camp and the apostolic team that was in the church of Antioch. Hallelujah. Yeah, Cyrene is in Libya. It's in North Africa. Amen. Amen. And there were already apostolic people who were from Africa in the original church in the book of Acts. So how does somebody, how dare anybody say Christianity is a white man's religion? And only idolatry and going to shrines and offering, pouring libations is the black man's culture. We read, those are the things, those are the priesthood that we now need to renounce. Because these priesthood voices and narratives have been speaking on behalf of Africa as if the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is foreign to us and we never connected with him, but we only connected with the altars and shrines of fallen angels. But today, as a united people across Africa, we hereby declare no unto them 
No to that priesthood, no to that narrative, no to those shrines. We embrace our heritage. We found our culture. We discover our identity inside of Jesus Christ and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you are with me, shout amen. Amen. This week, we need to, to renounce the wrong voices of priesthoods and altars that have postured to represent us. Shrines, astrologers, prognosticators, um, 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 snake charmers, voodoo and voodoo magic. And, and, and mother in the water spirits. That's what they call Africans around the world. Do you guys know? Brethren, you know, that's what they say we Africans are. are. That's what they said. They, they tell you it's just African culture. It's a tribe, but it is not our culture. It's definitely not my culture. And as a Melchizedek, I make a proclamation that from this season that lie is cut off yes that narrative is destroyed yeah. and no negative voice no shrine idolatrous voice will ever represent me not in the past not yeah. now not in the future not ever Woo. none of it will be legitimate yeah. no license yeah. to represent me and my people, my people anywhere around the world where they may be found. Amen. From tonight, it is a decree, Amen. a proclamation Amen. with priestly and prophetic authority. Amen. That shrine and priesthood Amen. is falling down. Amen. And the altar and the priesthood of Melchizedek is raised up for us as a people yes. in Africa. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Finally, finally, one more scripture before we return to Nim. There was a, there was a man's cross when Jesus Christ was being led to Golgotha, to the hills of Golgotha, to be crucified, to be killed by execution of crucifixion. And he had to carry his cross, his heavy cross, all around Jerusalem on his way to the death sentence. The Bible says he fell under the weight of the cross. Somebody says, why did he fall? Is he not the son of God? Does it mean he is weak? The reason why he fell is that he became a man to represent mankind. He didn't use divine strength to carry that cross. He did not use Samson's anointing that can move all gates. He didn't use anointing. He suffered it personally so that our sins and transgressions can be personally transferred to him, right? But on his way to the cross, when the cross was too heavy and fell off him, they, a man was hired to carry the cross with Jesus. And that man's name was what? Simon of Arima, Simon of Cyrene, Simon of Cyrene. That man, Simon of Cyrene was an African. That man was from Africa, amen. And what does that mean? That's a prophetic statement to say the last race to move the gospel powerfully before the second coming of Jesus will be the black race. Amen. In as much as black men were involved in the beginning, the black race will be prominent in carrying the cross of Jesus and the power of the cross of Jesus at the end of the age. That's why it was a black man 
that assisted Jesus in carrying his cross. Remember Paul said that I do all things that I may feel in my own body that which is left over of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Do you remember? So, so the black race is going to be partner with Jesus in carrying the power of the cross in the end of days. But you see, they were there in the beginning. So if, 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 if an African was there with Jesus to the very point of Golgotha, how can we say the gospel is not our heritage? How can we say that Christianity is not our priesthood? How can we say that the gospel is not original to Africa? How can we say it's a white man's religion? And then how can we tolerate it when some people say Black Lives Matter and they raise shrines in every one of their chapter and the whole of the globe from Europe to America to Asia, all of them carry the same mantra. And we agree, we don't agree. That, can't, that kind of outlook can't continue to be our front and representation for Africa anymore. And we have to start, because Black Lives Matter's founder said that they are voodooists, that they worship the, the, the West African deity, they pour libations, they have shrines at the center of every one of their chapters. And you know, and immediately a human being was killed. You know, that's human sacrifice. On the blood of somebody who was a criminal and, and a, 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 a drug addict and a cold, we now raise voice for Africa. You think it's gonna go well? I mean, do the pastors and brethren who are following that chant think that following the blood of a human being who was a killer of fellow, fellow human beings, an attacker of fellow human beings, and rising upon the steps of his blood to proclaim black lives, do you really think it will go well? What has happened since this began? Where black lives saved more in the past two, three months of this chaos, or the black lives die even more? Listen, the wrong people can't continue to judge. Floyd can't continue to be our voice. Tupac cannot continue to be our sound. No. Tupac means shining serpent. Do you guys realize that? Immediately that guy dies, they began playing his music. All in the name of black lives and churches are singing it. Do you really think that kind of human blood sacrifice is going to be for our good. Ob evidently and obviously, more black people have died since. The number of death rate, do you know what's going on? The gate of time for Africa reopened and the wrong priesthood jumped in. And that's why you see, we were, we were saying here that that is exactly what happened in the time of Nimrod. Can we go back? to Genesis chapter 10, right? And it says that Nimrod, Cush fathered Nimrod, Cush was the father of Nimrod, that's black, the black race, restarting after the flood. And he became the first fearless leader, wow, throughout the land, the very first. But look at what he did. He became a fearless hunter in defiance. Our problem was never greatness in Africa. Our problem was rebellion in idolatry against God. We used our leadership to lead the world into darkness. And that is where the cause came from. And this priesthood, this particular priesthood, stood up from the black race and represented the whole world. That's what happened. He didn't follow the priesthood of Noah in Genesis 8 and 9, offering clean animals to God, and God responding by breaking the curse on the land and releasing the rainbow, he began another priesthood that came from the black, as a black man, but to cover the rest of the races, right? And it became said like Nimrod, a fearless hunter in defiance against God. He's the one who set the pace of rebelling against God. He was, there was natural greatness 
and there is natural greatness in the African race. Why? Because God gave it. Our problem is when we take that greatness and turn it to the devil and turn it to fallen angels and turn it to demonic portals that open the door for all kinds of abominations to arrive from the nether realms. If you are hearing me, say amen. And the, look at verse 10. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad. How many of you have heard of the Akkadians? You might have heard of a movie that was made about the Akkadians. Do you know Nimrod set up that? Do you know Nimrod? Nimrod built cities. He take to build a city. While others were farmers and herdsmen, this man could build advanced systems and advanced civilizations. That's the black race. But you see, it was turned to the service of the devil. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad. Nimrod led the Akkadians and Kalne in the land of Shina. And out of that land, he went forth, went forth Ashur, that's the Assyrians, and builded Nineveh and the city of Rehoboth and Kala. Now, go to chapter 11. Chapter 11 of the book of Genesis, verse 1. Watch this. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of China and they dwelt there and burned them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone. I mean, this was the beginning of technology. And guess who was leading it? So it was Nimrod. Construction technology, geographical technology, Cosmic alignment technology, astrology, and astronomy. Who was leading it? Hmm. Let us build us a city. Look at what they were changing. They went from raw materials to manufactured materials. They said to one another, Go to let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And that, and they had brick for stone and slime they had for mother. But they were beginning to manufacture. They were not operating on raw material anymore. Look at verse 4. And they said, go to let us build us what? A city, an advanced civilization, right? In the then world. And what, what? A tower. A city and a tower. Whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make a name. Woo! You know, this is about greatness. That's what a tower. Did you notice that Nimrod's citywide architecture is still what is being employed in the modern city times, in the modern times of cities? Do you notice that every great city now in modern times will build skyscraper as a demonstration of their greatness? The highest, tallest building was previously in London, in UK. Then when America rose into power, America had the Empire State Building and then the Twin Towers. And now Middle East is rising and they are building all those high towers in Dubai and UAE. Do you know whose architecture that is? You know, the city and tower, um, please, okay, let's go on. The city and tower that Nimrod built was spiral in nature was like a ziggurat. It was rolling upwards. It had a rolling upward shape, a staircase upward shape. Have you seen the headquarters of the EU, European Union in Brussels? Have you seen it? Just Google it, watch the picture. It's an exact replica of the kind of tower that Nimrod built in Babel. Can you believe that? He's his doctrine and technology, his, his architecture for city shaping is still being adopted up until now. So don't tell me there is no priesthood for secular sphere. There is no priesthood for engineering. There is no priesthood for construction. Don't tell me there is no priesthood for technology, no priesthood 
for industry, no priesthood for, for leadership, for government, for advancement, for innovation, because that is the way innovation began in the first place. It began by priesthood, but you see that priesthood was turned against God. That tower they built, look at what they said about the tower, right? They said, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto where? Unto heaven. The word heaven there is Shemaim. Shemaim is plural. That's the heavens, right? As in the star realm, the cosmic realm, the visible heavens, the atmosphere, and then the spiritual heavens. That's what Shemaim is plural, right? That's what it means. That means they were building that tower onto heights as a high place for the cosmic powers, for the spiritual realm, for the fallen angels, principalities, and powers who remained in the atmosphere, who remained in the heavenly places. Why? Because a high place is actually an altar. Yes, brethren, an altar, the meaning of altar is a high place. Altar comes from the word altarus, altarus. That's Latin, right? Altarus, from where you get altitude. Mm. And altitude means height. Have you heard that phrase? Your attitude determines your altitude. It speaks about going high. You see, altarus is where you get the word altitude because an altar was a point of connecting the higher forces. It was a place of connecting higher powers. Because from the time of the fall of Adam, even before the flood, it became clear that what ruled the world of men at ground level was not at ground level with them. That what ruled and affected the lives and the destiny of nations and men and cities and people groups came from a high place. That's why you will find that the word high place is used interchangeably with the word altar in the Old Testament. You will remember when, if you are still with me, say amen. amen. All right. Please, Pastor Ernest, let me know how much time I have left, you know so that I can know how to uh, um, contain, uh, uh, contain my time, oh, right? Time okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pastor. I appreciate you. Now, now, watch this. When Solomon was made king after David, the Bible says he went to offer a thousand sacrifices unto God to ask him for wisdom, for knowledge, and for understanding, right? Right? The place where Solomon went was called the high place of Gibeah. Why is it called high place? Because it was an altar, which is exactly why he went there to offer sacrifice. If you are here, say amen. What is it about high place and about altar? It's because men from time immemorial Perceive that for men to get ahead, they can't stay with forces at ground level. For a man to survive and then go on to greatness. Look at, look at Nimrod. He said, let us make a name. Can you imagine? The idea of greatness came from the black race. The very concept of greatness came from, that's why they built, they built towers. Do you understand? In Hebrew, the word tower is called gadol. It, it means great, great place, a great place. It's to like connect and to impress upon the rest of the people a sense of highness and greatness. Do you see? And the concept of building a city and a tower to get a name, i.e. to get greatness was whose idea? It was the black man. Don't tell me we were not made great. The thing was that our greatness was to rebel against God. Oh, my God. But tonight, 
a royal priesthood has arisen. Yeah. A new generation. Yeah. A new kingdom people. Yeah. We are going to change this nonsense. Yeah. We need to tell the African Americans and tell the Brazilian Africans, tell the black race in Europe that that culture you are there using to represent us is a lie yeah. and a false narrative. Woo. If you are with me tonight, say amen. amen. I perceive and I see that our agreement is opening highways in the realm of the spirit all over Africa, all over Europe, all over America, all over the globe. Highways, because you are in South Africa, and I'm in Nigeria, and you are in Gambia, and you are in Ghana, you are in Senegal, you are in North Africa, in South Africa, in, 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 in Kenya and Ethiopia, in East Africa, in West Africa, and we are speaking into the realm of the spirit together. And our proclamation, declaration is opening highway. <laughs> opening pathway dimensions in the realm of the spirit. Do you believe that? Let's agree on that. Let's give a shout. Release a sound. Open new highways. Open new highways. God has gone up with a shout. The Lord with the sound of the trumpet. As we are sounding the trumpet, God is going up and creating highways and processions of a new truth, of a new rank. A new priesthood, a new incense all over the continent. We can do that because we are in agreement, releasing the trumpet sound of heaven at the same time from all over the continent. So we are not just going to limit ourselves and say, this is just a garden by technology. We are going to take the spiritual highway. We are going to take the spiritual traffic. We are going to do a new projection. That witchcraft projection will not survive. Yes, Magical voodoo projection over the airwaves and atmospheric current and the cosmic dimension over the whole of Africa and its race is being altered tonight. The program means prognostications and demonic manipulations that have gone on for eons for ages and for centuries is being counteracted and overturned right now because for the first time, a race of priesthood from all over the continent is releasing the same sound yeah. at the same time, at the same time, and making a new proclamation that the priesthood over our land is changed. Yeah. Give a shit to the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. The idea, yes, it's time for the very idea of greatness came from us. Have you been to Brussels? You maybe you can Google it. Did you see the headquarters of EU? It is built like a ziggurat, it is that turning formation of the Tower of Babel. And the way it ends, is as if it didn't end, it's supposed to go up. <laughs> the the e EU, aha, yeah. it's on display on screen right now. That is the Tower of Babel on the left. Look at EU headquarters on the right. Oh my goodness. So don't, don't say, don't say the altar of Nimrod is no longer available. Look at it right there in the middle of Europe but looking more sophisticated. And that's what we are saying. The ancient things have resurfaced in modern times, but now with greater sophistication. Oh my God. God will help us. God has begun to give us help. The lie of the enemy is being overturned tonight by our strategic fellowshipping territorially across the landmass of the continent under a prophetic mantle. Amen and amen. If you are with amen. me, say amen. amen. Look at this verse 4 of, of Genesis 11. They said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. That tower was a high place. The tower was an altar. 
That's the original idea of, of, of an altar. It's a high place for the purpose of connecting what? Principalities, powers, a host of spiritual wickedness in where? In heavenly places or in high places. I mean, Paul said that in the New Testament because Paul too understood that the demons and the fallen angels and false the gods that men, whoo, can you send me that term? That men worshipped were in high, principalities and powers in what? In high, high places. So what did man, man perceived that from the beginning. Paul realized it even in the New Testament times. So when man perceived that ruling forces were in high and heavenly places, what did he do? He built high places as altar and worship shrines to connect them, to tap into their power, to gain their help, because they found out that people didn't make progress at ground level. They couldn't go forward by themselves. They didn't survive wars as tribes. They were extinguished and extinct when other nations came against them. When the enemy came to gate, to their gates, their strength was often not sufficient until they began to tap into higher powers. And so every race and every tribe, every nation, not just in Africa, but around the world, had high place. And therefore, the purpose of priesthood and altars is not just for prayer, it is actually for power. It is actually for authority. It is actually for rulership. It is actually for influence. It is actually for government over the land. Forget whether there is election or no election. This is Africa. We know what happened, right? Forget America, whether election or no election. Forget Europe. Whether, when altars are set up and priests understand, priests understand the protocols of the territorial spirit, you see human beings won't go the way they want in a free will that their conscience and choice is supposed to afford them because they are overruling and over counteracting higher power has come into place. Forget freedom of choice. Forget freedom. Freedom, there is no freedom unless it is coming from a higher place. So long as a higher power is ruling, you need to forget about freedom and begin to activate priesthood. Therefore, you see, the people who had functional priesthood powers, and that's why you get the phrase higher power. If you are going to rule over men, you must come from a higher place. Meaning, you must be tapping into higher power. So you see, we have this that place you go to the front when you are answering altar call, right? Altar is that place where you go and give your offering. It's correct. You understand? It's correct. Altar is the place you go and pray. But let me let me say this right. The men who ruled their territories as kings were also equally priests. Because it became clear that if you were made king of the land and someone else was tapping into a higher power of that land, you won't be king, really. And you will not be king for long. So those kings, even in, I, I, have you seen the coronation of some of some kings in Africa and even in Europe? Have you seen the ceremony? You know where they take them to go and crown them before they come and do physical fanfare ceremony. You know the number of days and weeks that they spend in the bush. You know how many pregnant women that they kill to sex under their throne. You know how many heads that they bury with them when they die before they bring another one to replace and begin rituals again. To, to, do you know why? Why must a king to have power? Because it is higher powers that rule. And when God created the heavens in, the, in Genesis 1, during creation, he made the lights to rule. He said, Bible says in, in Genesis 1, 14, he made the greater light. He made the, 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 the greater light to rule the day the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also, and they shall be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years. So what does man do after he falls? He knows that the lights, including the falling morning stars, 
the fallen angels, they will rule. So what does he do? He builds a high place to connect heaven. That's Nimrod's language. Nimrod is the one who, after God had said, be fruitful, multiply, spread throughout the earth. Multiply, replenish the earth, have dominion over the earth. Nimrod said, no, no. Why will we spread? Let's not spread. I have a better idea than God. Let's stay together. Let's build a tower. Let's have a name of greatness. Let's connect the higher forces that are in rebellion against God. Let's open the gate for them. Let them come down, begin to sleep with women and produce giants and Nephilim. Let them teach the women witchcraft and sorcery. Let them teach the men warfare. Let them introduce technology that is negative so that more bloodshed can flow. Let them introduce the arts of war and of warfare. I know many of you have read the art of war by those people. Let me tell you something. You don't know whose book you have read. Some people have read the 48 Laws of Power, and they are practicing it as personal, personal agenda. Let me tell you, those books came from powers. Those are not laws of power. Those are laws of manipulation. It's born of soulish, soulish controlling witchcraft that is powered by spirits that work on kings, rulers, and generals from the ancient times. If you are hearing me, say amen. This Nimrod built a high place because he too, like Paul, right from his time, know that there are principalities and powers and rulers of this dark age and a host of spiritual wickedness in where? In heavenly places, in high places. He got the point. So he built high places. And as the priest, he got their protocol. Who is a priest? A priest is the person who stands between the spiritual and the natural. He stands between God and the people. He stands between heaven and the territories of the earth. We have had the idea that the altar is that place you just go and say a nice prayer. But you see, the original concept of altars, altarus, altitude, high place is for height, authority, and for power. It's for rulership and kingship over the peoples, over the lands, over the territories, to be able to smite with a mighty hand, <clears throat> to have victory during war, so that you can have dominion over others. The purpose of altars and high places was for rulership and dominion. Now we think it's for just for outside that place you go in front, just to have a small prayer point. It's good, it's correct, but I'm saying the original concept was way more than that. We have the idea that altar is where you go and give your offering. You give an offering and you, you give it in the offering basket <laughs> so that they can take it to the altar. And then they can listen to me. If there was an altar those days, there was blood. There's no, there's no, if this altar, there must be blood. There must be the life of men, the life of beasts or creatures that we represent men. The presence of items. And 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 um, um, human beings, animals, creatures, and produce of the land to represent the people and their territory. So in those days, if they say altar, it was not a nice wooden bench or a wooden pulpit. It was a, a place probably made of stone, right, where blood flowed. And if they say some of us have the concept of offering with the offering basket mentality. We have offering bowl mentality for offering. So when, when they pass, they say, let's give an offering. So they, they pass the offering bag or the offering basket or the offering bowl around and you come so that you can contribute to God. You come to an altar to give with a contribution mentality. No, when you give at an altar, you must be a priest or a priest must be representing you so that what you give enters the world of the spirit. When you, when, you, when you give on an altar, blood flows, and when blood flows, the realm of the spirit starts to move. That's why <laughs> the Bible says, David said, let my prayer come before you as incense, and let the lifting up of my hands be as the evening oblation, be as the evening sacrifice. You know, you know he, he, here we raise hand at altar, but David knew when I raise hand, it is priesthood because it involves sacrifice. And to David, sacrifice in his time and priesthood meant blood flowing. When a priest receives your offering, a real functional priest, your offering enters the realm of the spirit. 
It functions in the realm of demons and in the realms of angels. It functions for your territory, for your inheritance in the land, for the portion and the, po the points that are appointed unto you. That's why you see God combines the two for us. When he gave birth to us in the born again reality in Jesus Christ, inside of the New Testament, when he said through Apostle Peter that together, he put royalty, that's kingship with priesthood because ex that's exactly what a high place produces in you. A high place is an altar that connects you between the spiritual and the physical. And when you connect the higher power, you will rule among men. You are not a rule. That's why those priests, they knew the protocol of the deities, the, de the devils and the gods that they were worshipped. Our priesthood is to know God's priests in the Old Testament, they were very meticulous people. They were not strange, spooky people who were living in a daze and a haze, who didn't understand exactly what they were doing inside of that tabernacle. Let me tell you, the Bible, there are whole books written about priesthood in the Old Testament. The book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, even Deuteronomy, all of it were books on priesthood, on how daily sacrifice should flow, how there must be morning and evening oblation. I mean, think about it. The Old Testament was so full of offerings. In the morning, when you are walking by, you pass by the area of the temple, you will see smoke rising, the morning offering, the morning oblation. In the evening, you are strolling back again from office or from work, you pass by there, what do you see? You see smoke rising, the evening oblation. The Bible says, at about the time of the evening oblation, as Daniel was fasting and praying, that the angel Gabriel was caused to fly swiftly to appear unto him. I mean, think about it. When these guys offered incense and offered sacrifice, angels begin to move. Daniel had been fasting and praying, right? That's Daniel 9 and Daniel 10, right? And the angel came, but he didn't come until the time of the evening oblation. Oh, my God. David said, let my prayer come before you as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the what? When he does that lifting, he's not lifting up holy hands with no sacrifice. <laughs> when he lifts, the angels are moving. Evening sacrifice was when Elijah's fire fell. Evening sacrifice was when the smoky pillar and the furnace appeared between the offering and the sacrifice of of Abraham, when God was going to reveal the secret of the covenant and of the children of Israel in, in slavery to him, when God was going to confirm his promise to give him an heir, a son, the smoky pillar came at about the time of darkness, at the time of the time of the evening oblation. Jesus himself died at about the time of the evening oblation. The Bible says that the, 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 the land was darkened from the sixth to the ninth hour. That's when Jesus died. That's about the beginning of the time of the evening oblation. The priest, the priest knows gates of the spirit realm. The priest knows gates of the territory. Not the physical fanfare gates, the real spirit gates. The priest knows highways in the spirit. The priest knows the protocols of offerings and sacrifice. He knows the exact sacrifice to offer. In the book of Exodus 11, because if they offer the wrong sacrifice, with the wrong manner, using the wrong fire, or having the wrong face or posture, they will die instantly. Nada Barabi, who died instantly because the fire they were carrying was. <laughs> Amen. So don't tell me priests were not precise people. They were not confused. They were accurate. They were not confused, straying people, spooky people who tied red cloth and jumped from altar to altar in a stage of in a state of madness. No, these guys were calculative. They were specific. They were the ones who received the offerings from the children of Israel. It means they were accountants. They were the ones who caught the animals on the altar in a very prescribed way. It means they were vet doctors. They were the ones who checked whether the rash on people's body was scared, this was just rash, or whether it was leprosy, meaning they were medical officers. That's why Jesus, when he healed those two lepers, what did he tell them? He said, go and show yourself to the what? To the priest. So how say ye that priesthood is just that thing that they said we are, a royal priesthood in the New Testament, when God 
knew and the devil knew the whole of mankind knew that priesthood was the key to power authority influence rulership dominion and all together survival of a race yeah. but the favor god did us in the new testament was he said as you are born again in christ jesus you are a royal what priesthood it yeah. is time for you and me to activate the portals and the high places of god in our territory in our land because when the priesthood of God functions that's when the kingship of God will begin to enter the land it is real anointed priests that know the territorial portals they even know, they know the finance portals they know the angelic portals they know the original gates and high places of the territory they don't just even know where the shrines of the devil were they know where the angels landed and when they go and align those places the scrolls of their territory will be given unto them the scrolls of their kings they will name their kings the history and the cover and the power and the book of their kings like daniel did in babylon their books will be downloaded for the prophet and they will become prophetic priests right the gates of their land will be given unto them the ability like noah to offer an offering that we please god and break the curse of poverty which is what came on the african lace break the curse of poverty over the land like noah did that authority will be given unto them guess what as it was in the then days so shall it be that it is priests that will always rule it will just be a matter of time tonight i want to begin to stop right now because i've taken so much time already but tonight, I want to say before I go that your priesthood is activated. Amen. For your region, for your house, for your region, for your, for your street, for your area, for your territory, for your city, for your nation, and for this Africa, our priesthood is activated. Amen. We are working the original covenants of Yahweh for Africa, the territorial alignment the maps of the spirit, the scrolls of the plans of God, the representation and the manifestation that heaven intended for Africa in Simon of Cyrus and the other black tribes of God that participated with Joseph and Moses and all the covenant Abraham, Isaac and Jacob people throughout scripture days, we are working the original witness we are working the witness of the utopian eunuch. We are working the witness of Philip who preached to him. We are working the gospel, the, the speaking and the witness of the apostles of the Lamb. And we are working the witness of Christ Jesus himself with his cross, speaking to the African man. We are working it and we arise as the priesthood who bear the protocol and the representation. And we declare now the covenant of God over Africa, awakened, stirred up, and functional by a new royal priesthood in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Lift your hands, just begin to pray. My God, we've taken so much time. Go ahead, pray. That's what we need to do. We, we can't allow Nimrod to represent us anymore. We can't allow Nimrod, we can't allow black things, the demonic things to represent us anymore. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Look at the final thing that was said in the scripture. And they said, Genesis 11, 4, and they said, go to let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad from the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men build. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. This they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So you see, it was the altar of the black man that represented the whole world. It gathered the whole world in disobedience under God. And that's what just happened in recent times. The time gate became open again for Africa to begin to enter into some things. That's why the prophecy came. Now, that's the things we're saying. We're prophesying about a different Pentecost around that May into June, right? And the professor, this pro prophecy came a while later. Around the same time, Black Lives Matter came with their shrines and their altars. And guess what? The white race, the red race, the Asian race all responded. That was Nimrod screaming again. That's the altar of Nimrod to gather all races, but in disobedience to God. 
Why? Because the time gate has opened again. Africa is supposed to emerge with a new generation, but the former priesthood is trying to take its place. The old demonic Nimrod representing Africa to the world wants to function again. And that is why we are getting together and we are praying and we are by prayer activating our priesthood. And we are saying that old voice that took us from greatness and sent us into slavery will not emerge at the turning of time again. This time it is our scrolls from heaven that will be spoken by priests and prophetic voices yeah. from all over the race and all over this continent. God bless you. That's the word I have. Hallelujah. Pastor Ernest, please go ahead. Take over, Pastor Ernest. Thank you very much. Let's begin to pray, brethren. That's the prayer. That is the strategic thing that we need to do right now. Verse 16. 
see a revelation on this scripture. I now understand why the Lord said, He said, I shall make you fishers of men when he met the disciples on the road, on, 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 on the beach. Hallelujah. The Lord told me last year or last two years that my son read Jeremiah 16, 16. Jeremiah 16 says, Behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. And afterwards, just as the man of God was explaining, Nimrod was the mighty hunter. Also, that anointing and that grace was bestowed by the Lord unto the black man. And yet the black man used it for his own glory and not of the Lord. But he says in Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 16, afterwards, after the fishermen have come to the assignment and bidding of the Lord, and afterwards, he himself is going to say, Afterwards, I will send for many hunters. Ah, someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. I will send for many hunters. And they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill. And out of the holes of the rock. And as the man of God was speaking, he spoke about Simon of Cyrene. How come he gave his soldiers to bear the, 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 the cross of the living God? At one part of the last, he put to actually aid the Lord in fulfilling his assignment. As the African grace, oh God, as the grace of the Lord is being released on Africa. He's releasing the anointing of the fishermen and the rest of the husband. We are going to advance, oh God, with the gospel of the kingdom. And we are going to be deep, oh God. Hey, the broken waters of the living God. Right now, we declare, we declare, let the hunters of America arise in the name of Jesus. Let the hunters of the land arise in the mighty name of Jesus. Let the sons and daughters of the land where be they hide, oh God? Right now, this is the season of our glory. Let the trumpet be sound and call for the hunters from where they have been hiding. The season of glory is now. May our soul be given as the altar of the living God to carry the cross of the living God. Right now, in the name of Jesus, let the hunters arise. Let them arise. For a highway is built, stretching from Egypt to Egypt. Say it alone. It is the highway of holiness. Let them write your travel upon it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Hope you are making a blessing.
Teachings and been a blessing unto us. You have set the tone for our week, and I'm very certain that as Africa, we shall stand together and, and we will rise to the occasion of priesthood that has been delivered unto the sons and daughters of the Lord. We shall not fail the Lord again, for we are the last living and the nation of the living God. There is no other after us, and so we shall not fail God. In fact, we don't have the privilege of failure. And so, as sons and daughters of the Lord, we are making a bold declaration that we are standing in defiance of the priestly order of Nimro. And we take up the mantle of Melchizedek, the priestly order, order of Melchizedek. And we stand as priests and we give Africa unto you, God. We give Africa unto you, God. For in your word, you say, Africa, Egypt shall become my people. Lord, thank you for sanctity. Thank you for citizenship. Lord, honor us, for we are yours. We thank you, Father. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Those of East Africa and South Africa are so sorry for the time, but all of you can attest to the fact that we needed this message. But amen. We sponsor this message on our Facebook. It is possible. Hallelujah. We will make sure it is amen. as easy as possible. Amen. 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 Am
Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to Jesus. Amen. 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 We are going to try as much as possible to actually uh, sponsor the video on our Facebook so we can send it to as many people as if you want to contribute to the class in any way. You can contact uh, this number 02 plus 233 249 5907 or talk to any of your leaders, your uh, zonal leader, the East African leader, the West African leaders. You can even have, you have my number on Zoom, you have my number on Telegram, sorry or any of the other pastors for whom you have been connected to this ministry. We are going to sponsor. I don't know. I was telling my wife, I think I need my brain to be massaged. But anyway, but this person is going to go for If we can even transcribe it, we'll try and get there as much as possible. But it is a message for the time and the season. God bless you. So if you want to support and sponsor in any way, please kindly, uh, I mean, just come to the Telegram group or just send me a personal message. Add class 233 to my number. So those of outside of Ghana can actually have access. So God bless you. Tomorrow as well, we'll be having another session. We'll be having two amazing ministers and they'll also be taking us to the session. I want to share the ministers with you so uh, you know those who are coming. Tomorrow we have two amazing men of God from Ghana. Uh, one of them is called Prophet Kafui from Ghana. Hallelujah. Prophet Kafui from Ghana and also Pastor Hihidi from Malawi. They are going to be leading us in prayer. And I know that we'll be blessed. Hallelujah. So may God richly bless you so much for joining tonight's feed. Share the messages on our Facebook. But tag people. If possible, just tag people. And we mention people under the comments. And make sure they listen to this message. That is a very sure way of actually reaching people organically. So just tag people under the message. Mention their names and, you know, ministries, pages. Share it. Have Become an evangelist. Bible says that what? Make plain what? The vision. And he that readeth may run. So just ask me, make it be made plain. Just tag people's names and life and they shall run with it. So may God bless you so much for tonight. We'll be meeting again same time tomorrow. And so from all of us, all over Africa, God bless you so much. My name is Pastor Ennis Kujabidiaku. The man of God who preaches for Prophet Babs Adewumi. If I'm going the name wrong, kind of forgive man of God. Adewumi, God bless you so much. And I'm very certain that we'll meet again. May God richly bless you. Hallelujah. God bless you so much. Hallelujah. Wow, wow, wow. Please you cannot end the feet. Hallelujah. God richly bless you. God richly bless you. Go through the chat first and any information that we post. Hi. Kindly. Amen. The recording will also be shared later Amen. on. Amen. We've got an online. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 